Welcome to Elevate, a Women's Leadership Institute podcast where we showcase stories, celebrate successes, and shift culture. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Women's Leadership Institute podcast, Elevate. I am here with the amazing James Kemp. He is the Executive Director of Connect Capital, and we welcome you to the show today. Thank you. It's great to be here. I've uh, listened to many of the podcasts that you guys do and have been a big fan of yours for some time now. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so let's just kick it off with yeah. having you explain a little bit about what you do and then maybe share something personal just so we can get to know you a little bit. Sure, sure. Um, I, I've actually been in the Silicon Slopes area in Utah for about uh, 35 years now. It makes wow. me feel really old when I say that, but um, I started way back in 87 at Word Perfect and then Novell yes, and then yes. bounced around to a few different places and then uh, Omniture and then ultimately Adobe uh, mm -hmm. that acquired Omniture back in 2009. Yeah. And then I stayed for another 10 years. So I've been in the enterprise software area for quite some time. Um, and now I'm doing uh, something that's a bit of a off ramp for me. Okay. Um, you know, working with Connect Capital, we do, uh, we basically, uh, search for businesses and founders that have really good ideas and we help them with, with training and preparation and that, and then we give them a, a, a voice or a microphone and they are able to pitch their presentations and their businesses to, uh, prospective, uh, investors or to, uh, people that might be interested in their product or service. So, um, it is a bit of a departure. Um, although I have done a lot of work with evaluating companies. Mm -hmm. When I was at Adobe, um, I ran the uh, due diligence and then post-acquisition integration of uh, 20, 20 acquisitions that we did during that 10, 15 years I was there. And, uh, but we did many more uh, diligence reviews, well over 100 diligence reviews of companies and uh, with the intent of trying to find the ones that fit best, that had the best business mm -hmm. model and that. So uh, I've actually had quite a bit of experience working with founders and trying to identify whether businesses have uh, have what it takes, so to speak, to uh, yeah. to be successful. And we weren't successful with all of them, but we were really close on most of them. Uh, a few of them were home runs and there were a couple strikeouts that we sure. did as well along the way. But uh, um, and, and then I just have a passion for it. My father was an entrepreneur okay. uh, pretty much his whole life. And so I kind of grew up around that and saw the good and bad side sure. of being an entrepreneur. And um, But I'm excited to be a part of this organization. You know, 41 years of an organization is, is a lot of uh, history, but it's also a, a, a pretty heavy weight on your on your shoulders yeah. to make sure you don't mess it up. So yeah. that's my, my goal is to hopefully keep it going and not, not screw it up. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I love that you pointed out that everything has hits and misses yes. or, you know, just the yes. learning through it. Um, and starting out with Microsoft yeah. and Novell. Wow. That's that whole journey right here in this Valley of tech has been. Yeah. Interesting. One of the, I remember one of the worst days that at least we thought was one of our worst days was, uh, when Microsoft kind of turned their guns on Novell and were perfect and, and kind of ran us out of town. Um, and those two companies uh, kind of uh, went away, you know, with the, with the wind, so to speak. Um, but I actually think it was one of the greatest things that could have happened to mm -hmm. this area. Um, there were literally thousands of employees that needed to find new uh, new work and many of them started their own business. Started their and own, so yeah. I kind of think about it like the, those dandelions that have the, all the white seeds yeah, around yeah. them, not the orange ones that every season they're long, but the other ones, when you blow those seeds, they go everywhere and they just start. Uh, and that's kind of what happened with uh, with this uh, Silicon Slopes arena. And it really led to a lot of the success that's come from that. So I had never thought about it like yeah. that, but I can see that. How interesting. Yeah, yeah very cool. Um, okay, so let's talk about... Some people have said that in the startup space, you have dram dramatically changed the landscape. And as you've become the executive director of Connect Capital, um, I'm interested in your perspective on one of the hardest ways of shaping a company into a fundable entity. Like you talked about your experience of right, bringing people into the corporate space and seeing if they were a fit. And now with Connect Capital, when people come pitch, what do you look for to see if it is fundable or if it will work? 
You know, it, it's interesting. Uh, most companies are founded by people that had a passion about a particular yeah. product or service. Yeah. Very, f- very few people just say, I'm going to start doing this and, you know, out of the blue and some other uh, different arena. Um, and so there's usually passion. There's usually a background or a story of some sort that mm-hmm. causes people to, uh, to start businesses. Yeah. Um, but the a passion for something or a desire to do something isn't necessarily a roadmap for success. Um, (laughs) In fact, you know, there's a number of uh, sad stories of people that have started businesses by uh, taking, you know, loans out on their own credit or or taking uh, you know, home, home equity loans or, you know, that kind of thing in it and businesses don't work. And then it causes financial problems and divorce and all the other things that come with it. So it, there's a reason why most enterprises, most startup enterprises fail. And, um, mm. it's sad that that's the case, but that, that really is, it's, it's the Serengeti plane, right? It's mm. you're the gazelle that has to get to water and then back every <laughs> single day. And they're, they're <laughs> lions sound and, too hopeful. and jackals and all those you know things running around trying to get you, but that's kind of what it is. And so mm. what we try and do is, is one of two things. One is we, we try and help the individuals to fail quickly, which sounds bad, but we try and help them understand that, look, this may or may not be the right thing for you Mm. or the business model, it may not be a good thing. And that sounds crazy that you would do that, but sometimes the biggest gift or the greatest gift you can give to someone is before they go down that road, absolutely, kind of head that off and say, this maybe isn't quite the business either for you or it's not really a business that's marketable or, you know, the ability to make it work. Because just because it's someone's passion doesn't mean that they are going to get money for their passion. exactly and and that their passion will be what other people have a passion for that's right so their success uh may may not be tied to this particular venture that they're mm-hmm. going through but there are so many that are good um incredible businesses incredible ideas and the 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 biggest challenge that people have is they just have a hard time getting the word out to the right audience so yeah. Um, there, there are literally thousands of investors and companies that are looking to invest in new companies and find, trying to find good, mm-hmm. uh, good ideas in that. And sometimes they just need a little bit of a leg up to get in front of that right on it. Mm-hmm. And so one of the things that really sets Connect Capital apart is we have a incredible network of what we call mentors. Um, yeah. A mentor is typically someone who's had a lot of success in business usually has started their own businesses and have sure. exited uh, successfully. And so um, when when someone comes in with a business idea, one of the things that we do that's different than really any other accelerator yeah. is we, we hook them up with those mentors. And normally these mentors would mm. charge a significant rate. You know, they're all successful businesses. They, they either have financial backgrounds or whatever. And sure. so to get access to this group of people, it, it would be very expensive under normal circumstances, but with Connect, they, they're, you know, we we go out and we find these mentors that are looking to give back and looking to pay it forward, mm-hmm. and so so they're willing but, to invest some time. Yeah, and they're willing to do it on a pro bono basis, and they're willing to help out these these companies, and that's really kind of the secret sauce of, yeah. of the Connect model is the uh the fact that we have those mentors that are willing to do that and that's so bold. that's a big part of the success that these companies mm-hmm. have with connect and over the years I, I was doing some research this week um over the 41 years that we've been doing uh what we call investors choice events which are these annual yeah. events over 500 companies have pitched on stage at or at these events and about 26% of those mm-hmm. have received funding. Mm. And so, and, and, and these are the all the rock stars of Utah. Yeah. Right? Uh, in fact, uh, Josh James and John Pastana presented on stage, uh, Jan Newman and Greg Butterfield. Uh, so there's a number of companies out there that have really had success that were mm. on stage as young founders mm. looking for uh, you know, that, that big break. And, yeah. and so it's a, it's an incredible organization. Okay. So tell me, for those of us who don't know, tell me the difference between the, your pitch competitions and the mentors. So is how they get into mentorship is, <coughs> so I go, I pitch, and then if they're interested, then they start to men- mentor me and investor. It's actually, uh, 
it's actually the reverse of that. Okay. So when we find a company that is a good candidate for what we believe is a good okay. business, um, we actually assign them a team of mentors. Typically it's six mm. to eight people. And they actually meet with those mentors leading up to the event. All leading up to the event. Yeah, so okay. six to eight weeks out, usually even before then, they'll start meeting with them on a on at least a weekly basis. Sometimes as you get closer to the event, they'll do it multiple sure. times a week. And they just do weekly meetings with them. They review their mm. their business model. They look at their financial models. They they look at their go to market plans, things like that, and and they help them with their pitch deck. Okay. Um, and they they refine it, and they you know they work with them, and they they actually go through examples of it. they'll they'll actually go through the pitch event with those mentors, and the mentors will stop them and say you know I think you should mm. say it this way or do it that Amazing. way. Amazing, yeah. And so when they finally do get on stage, yeah, they they have had significant experience and their their comfort and their confidence level is at a high yeah because they've been through that process and so and in fact in most cases those those mentors are in the green room with them right before yes. they go on the stage and then they're able to celebrate that success afterwards um we had 21 founders on stage at our event in april and it was so fun to see the green room with all of the mentors mm. there. And it was almost as if um, the founder's success is what the mentors found success in as well. So it was, it's really kind of a, a pretty incredible recipe of, yeah. uh, of success over the years. Yeah. Um, and I think that most of what I hear is people who want people who've been there. Yeah. Right. You've done this. What does this look like? You know, I have an idea, this, this and this. Um, I went to my first pitch competition yeah. and watched it in April, and it was really amazing. This, and they were all so different. The pitches were all so different mm -hmm. in how they presented, whether they focused on finances or whether they focused on the product or the market. Um, it was really interesting to see people pitching. Yeah. What, what, in your opinion, makes a great pitch? Um, I, you know, I think it's, it's like everything else, right? With, and it's becoming even more and more important important now with our with our devices and the things that make sure. it our our attention spans are are <laughs> rapidly shrinking yes. um you know for better or for yeah, worse you see right? the goldfish oh look it's a castle oh look it's a castle the, <laughs> yeah. the fish that swims around that's kind of how our society is and so mm. they've got to have the ability to capture the hearts and minds of those individuals pretty quickly mm -hmm. so um, you know, we, we had each of our presenters had 10 minutes. Um, there's some people who said that's too long. It needs to be like five minutes. Um, and you would think that it would be hard to portray a message or build excitement around a particular company in that short amount of time. And I would say they really only have like one minute or even 30 seconds to capture the mm -hmm. interest of the individual. Mm -hmm. Um, investors like everybody else, right? They, um, they have a short attention spans. They're looking to move on. They're looking yeah. to try and find the next thing. And if you lose them in the first few minutes, it's it's not likely you're going to get them back. You, you know, you may find them down the road in that, another yeah. event or whatever. So so people have got to capture those that heart those hearts and minds. And I think a few of them did a tremendous job. One of the, one of the ones that we had talked about a very personal experience he had with a relative that had um, had sepsis and and nearly died um mm -hmm. and interesting my own daughter uh was in a very similar situation oh. and they didn't know what she had at first and so he has a business that does a test to identify oh, sepsis and it's, okay. it's it's back within i think 45 minutes whereas wow. it used to be several hours sure. or whatever and that could have saved you know her some time she was fine she ended up making it but um but that was something that captured at least my attention yeah, and I think a lot of other people. Mm -hmm. um, and so you got to have that hook. You've got to have that, that, um, that, that story or that compelling reason mm -hmm. that captures people's yeah. uh, attention. And then once you've got their attention, then you can talk about the financial piece and the go to market and, and talk about what the return on investment would be for an investor. Sure. But they've got to believe some in in the product or the service. Mm. They got to have, you got to capture their their imagination uh, early. And is that go back to knowing your demographics, knowing who you're speaking to, or it who is, particularly and, you want to pitch for this specific? Yeah, case? I think there are always particular investors that are 
are maybe a little bit more um, within your your target market. Um, and sometimes that's hard to gauge, you know, because at our event, we had about, there were 400 some odd people that were there. 100 of them, at least, you know, at least 100 were investors. Um, but it's hard to know what those investors are interested yeah. in and that. So it's, it is a challenge. And that's where I think uh, you mentioned this. I think there's some founders that hit the mark more than others. And that could have been just who the investors were that were in the in the space. Sure. Or it could have just been, you know, that their story or their pitch was a bit more refined or more mm -hmm. compelling. Uh, it's hard to tell sometimes. And sometimes you find it in very unique and unexpected ways you'll be talking to somebody you're mm -hmm. you know you you you're at the movie or you're here or there and you talk to somebody you know we're all very social people yeah. i am a huge introvert i have been my whole life what? but i've kind no. of forced myself <laughs> i've trained myself to to kind of uh, step out of that uh, that shell but um you know entrepreneurs love to talk uh, about their businesses yeah. and so Sometimes it's just in a hallway conversation at an event or at some other uh, activity where you find somebody that might be a good potential investor. So, yeah, uh, sales and the ability to get people on board with you is not like a one time conversation yeah. in a specific place. It's an ongoing. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Uh, investors, friends of mine have said the first meeting is only intended to get a second meeting. And the second meeting is only intended to get a third meeting. And it's after, it's after, you know, you know, a dozen or more conversations with an investor before they actually will bring out their checkbook and write a check. Mm. And so some people think you've got to close that deal in that first interaction. Really all you're doing is just trying to set up the second the interaction because nobody, nobody that first meets you is going to give you money right out of the shoot. Um, they're, they're going to have to know about you. They're going to have to spend mm. time with you. Sure, because they want to know their your investment is, is yeah. sound. Yeah. And so sometimes people, I think, try and go for the close on day one. And that might be offensive. Really, yeah, actually it is. They say if you if you ask for advice, you get money. And if you ask for money, you get advice. And so... Um, <laughs> That's good. So, I want you to say that again. That's really yeah, good. So, yeah, it's, if you ask for money, mm -hmm. you get advice. If you ask for advice... You get money, and I it's can because see that. people just you know they're not they're not interested in that hard sell during that first yeah uh, interaction. That's really interesting because as I was so you know we also teach uh, a political development series for women wanting to run, and we were talking to some fundraisers and they were saying that a, a woman went in kind of dodged around the question right. This was a big funder who often mm -hmm. gave to political candidates. And uh, she didn't. She didn't close the deal. She didn't ask. Yeah. And afterwards, the story was that they were offended. She didn't ask because mm -hmm. they wanted to give money. They wanted to give money, but they wouldn't because she never asked. So yeah. I think it's really interesting to know the ecosystem you're in and what that looks like. Well, and I think it's very clear for you to indicate that 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 is something you're either asking or will be asking mm -hmm. for. I think it's important to do that. Um, but I think the difference is, is you don't have to convince them in that first interaction, mm -hmm. right? You, you can start to talk about your business. You can talk about the things you're doing. You're just and in up. the background, there's always that undercurrent of this says, Hey, look, I, I need funding for this to be successful, but going hard at the close on that first, uh, interaction, um, it can often backfire. So yeah. I think it depends on the situation, but you, there, you know, they should be very clear that you're an event, you're a business looking for investors. Sure. But but if you push to try and close the whole thing all in one interaction, then sometimes you'll turn people off. So it's kind of like mansplaining, right? Yeah. These are people who know money and investing very well. So mm -hmm. a hard close might be like, yeah. slow your roll. <laughs> like yeah. let's chat a minute. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. Um. So we talked a little bit about your experience for Adobe Digital. Um, where you played a pivotal role in facilitating substantial growth from 300 million to 3 billion. It's huge. Um, in reoccurring revenue over the decade. So for these people who are looking to start a business or participate or start an initiative within their business, how, what are a couple growth strategies? How does that look? Yeah. So, so very few companies get to unicorn status. Right? Yes. Um, um, we all can hope. Yes, we all can <laughs> hope. Uh, the interesting thing, though, is that 
Omniture, which is the company that I was with before Adobe acquired mm-hmm. us. So in 2009, I was a member of the corporate development team. Um, the Adobe announced the acquisition of Omniture. I remember I was at Disneyland on in the frontier land, sitting on a little bench <laughs> okay. with my, with my son when the email came out. And so, um, but shortly after that, um, I joined the executive team as a, as kind of that chief of staff, uh, op- business operations leader. And so we, it was funny, every day was bigger. Every day we were running a business that was bigger than it was the day before. And it was bigger mm-hmm. than a business that we had ever run. So we grew from 300 million in annual revenues okay. to 3 billion in annual revenues over that 10 year window. And it was a rocket ship ride. It was, it was crazy. And a lot of it came because Adobe saw the vision and they were able to invest and they, sure. and they really kind of rat, ratcheted up our, our activity. Um, but prior to that, that's where a lot of that growth came from. And I got to give, you know, Josh James and John Pastana and those guys a tremendous amount of credit. Um, back in the early nineties, they were those rough up and comer type <laughs> okay. entrepreneurs um, they were very aggressive in their model. They were very focused on sales. They were very mm-hmm. focused on customer execution. And one of the things that you can never, you can never fake is a product or service that your customers love, right? You can, you can try and find what that is. You know, sometimes you can at least say you can put lipstick on the pig and you right. can make it look like it's right. better than it is. But at the end of the day, if the customers don't love what your product or service is, mm. you're not going to be successful. And so for them, it was a new industry. It was web analytics. You know, mm-hmm. everybody was, you know, involved in the internet. And, and these guys came up with this brilliant idea of trying to figure out, okay, how many people are coming to your website and what pages are the most engaging right. and, and how do you, you know, market back to those individuals? So they just had a tremendous idea and then they just worked harder than anyone else. Mm. And I remember a conversation I had with Josh just kind of in passing. Um, he goes, we were willing to work harder than anyone else because, you know, and by doing that, by working harder than anyone else, we were able to live like very few people live. And so a lot of times it's just hard work. It's it's the ability to be tenacious and yeah. and to just stick to it and, and move, you know, and don't make the same mistakes over and over to learn from them, but... Yeah. Um, but just be tenacious about yeah. just staying with it. And some businesses you can't do that because no matter what you do, it's not going to work. Mm. And we help, we try and help uh, founders, you know, with that. See that yeah. It's like that fail quickly I was talking yeah. about. But for the most part, if you have passion for a business and it's a product your customers love, it's usually just a matter of outworking them, mm. outworking the competition. Well, and it sounds like there's also an element <laughs> of being nimble, yeah. right? Because it's hardworking, but it's also like, oh, we're shifting this here. We're moving this here. And sometimes when corporations get bigger, I feel like startups are so good at that. But sometimes when corporations get bigger, they don't they don't pivot as quickly. Well, and it's because there's their margin for error is much bigger. Right? Mm, when you're when bigger. you're a founder, every dollar matters. Yeah. Every, you know, I mean, there's a reason why most companies have that story, right? Of you know, Amazon, Jeff Bezos in his, in his garage. And, yeah, you know, they're the, hungry. The Amazon word kind of handwritten on the wall. And then, um, you know, I'm sure that there were many occasions where a lot of the superstar companies that have come out of Silicon Slopes where they were, um, you know, their tables were those pop-up folding tables. And <laughs> right. I remember, it's not I can't remember the, where the story came from, but there was one that would say, you know, hey, um, everybody save your work. I'm going to run the microwave for a minute to, to warm up my lunch mm. because if they ran it, nobody, you know, the, the odds of it shutting down the, the network or the power network yeah. is pretty high. So they said, save your work, save your work. All right. And then, you know, there's always those kind of early stories that you yeah. just kind of laugh about. And, um, but yeah, they're nimble. They're, they're willing to, you know, work harder and every dollar makes a difference. Whereas a large corporation, there's so much room for, you know, margin for error. You know, you don't, you're not as hungry. You're not as dedicated. So sometimes you don't pivot as quickly as you mm. should. So. Interesting. So um, you are, I met you because you're such a great ally for the work that we do at the Women's Leadership mm-hmm. Institute. I'm getting more women involved in investing, pitching. Um, I think it's like 3% of the money from venture capitalists goes to women. Um, and yet women 
own a lot of businesses. So there's kind of a disparity yeah. there. What, what is the, and I know there are many, but what is the one thing you think will help that disparity? You know, I, I thought about this a lot. I, first of all, I have four daughters. Okay. Um, three of them are, you know, solopreneurs, right? They do work out of their home and they're, you know, trying yes. to, so they're raising kids, but they're also running uh, businesses. Yeah. Um, and I think the biggest thing that I've found, at least that we can do is, um, you know, Utah is one of the best business environments in the, in the country. In fact, I think it's been ranked number one in a number of different, right. um, you know, calculations or whatever. Yes. Sometimes I wonder how they figure all that stuff out. But, <laughs> right. but anyway, Utah is a tremendous uh, opportunity. But you're right. Very small percentage of that goes to women. And I think the work that you guys are doing, the Women's Leadership Institute, as well as other groups mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, in the government, governor's office of economic opportunity, yeah. um, the you know, Chamber of Commerce, all the work that these individual key leaders um, have done um, is making a difference. But I think the biggest thing is I don't think there's necessarily a an intentional effort to cut women out of that market. I just think that there is a, I don't know if it's a societal bias. I, I don't know what it is, but for some reason there's, we're just not getting as much traction there as we could. Mm -hmm. And so I guess what I would say is that I think men in the community yeah. need to change. And, and, and I, and, I, <laughs> anyway, and we were, we, I think we met a week or so back and yeah. I talked about men are just dumb. We, we just don't even know what we're the, what we're doing even impact <laughs> well, i don't know that i'd say that men are dumb well, i think, I, that I they're, think just they're focused they're on very what smart they, in some ways but yes. in some ways they're just they're they're just accustomed to things being the way that they sure. have been and so i think in in many cases it's just a matter of of getting people to think differently when it comes to that mm -hmm. and and you know sadly some of the problem is is that um you know there's there's this feeling of, hey there's a good old boys network and that yeah. And I think in some cases there are. I mean, the investment communities, if you go to, you know, angel startup groups or whatever, a lot of them are there and they're just with all of the same kind yes. of people. Yeah. And so, you know, I don't think they intentionally say, hey, we're going to go into this event today and we're going to help the men, the male right. founders, and we're not going to help the women founders. But because they're surrounded by a lot of the same people and that, that, that kind of, um, you know, just thought process dominates those communities, those, yeah. those conversations. Um, and I think men need to step up. I, I think we need to, we need to be aware that there is an issue there and we need to be aware that, um, that maybe we're looking at things through that bias. And, um, I may not be very popular if I say that, but I think that, um, I think we have a, a responsibility mm -hmm. and you know i i've had a wonderful opportunity of working for companies that have very good diversity you know adobe is one of the greatest companies yes. when it comes to that um probably half of the people i worked with uh, were considered to be in that minority class women and people of color etc mm -hmm. and and i just think you know you almost just get used to the idea that they're just part of the organization and they're just part of the success. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so I think it's kind of a mindset as much as anything. And, and I guess I would challenge uh, men in those, in those roles to, to question their thoughts and, mm. and, you know, that kind of a thing. And I, I don't know what the best option or best decision is to make yeah. that happen, but I think we've got some work to do. It's interesting because often my co-host is Chris Jenkins, who uh, is a startup founder with Mobley. And he, we've talked about the fact that when you're just starting, like you get your friend, you get your best friend, you get who you went to college with, you know, like people very similar to you yeah. to just start running and building this thing. And so there comes a point when you're like, wait, we need to have some women on our team. Where do we, we need some minorities, but where that happens as businesses grow is really up to the company, right? Especially yeah. in Utah, it's not regulated, it's not mandated, it's just up to the company. But I do think it's easier for those founders and startups to pivot than larger mm -hmm. corporations. Um, do you know about the state startup initiative that is mm -hmm. just, um, yeah. I'm interested in if you'd ever think it'd fly with a business community to put something in there like, do you have a, if you reach, I don't know what the number is, 20, 50. Do you have a woman uh, in your group? Do you have a minority? Like, I don't know. What do you think? 
You know, I there's there's a lot of debate about yeah. the best way to fix that, that yeah. issue, right? Um, and I'm not a politician. Um, I don't know the best way to solve things, but I do know this. Um, we tend to uh, um, associate with people that are similar to ourselves. Yeah. And um, it, 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 is, it is difficult to break outside of that sometimes. And so um, I think that there is a need for us to change the way we think about, about that. Mm-hmm. One of the nice things about Adobe and really even Omniture before was a lot of my colleagues were, were women. And I didn't even think about that. I didn't even, you know, I didn't even think, oh, well, we have, there's four women. And mm, it wasn't like men. a task. Yeah. It wasn't, wasn't like that. And it just kind of came. But you know what? Adobe worked really hard to get to that point. Yeah, it's got to be and, deliberate. Yeah, it's got to be. And I guess what I would say is that it it's sad that we have a society where that's still an issue, mm-hmm. still a struggle. Um, I think we need to admit that that's the case, and I think we need to <laughs> try and address that. Yeah. Now, I don't know if um, affirmative action or things of that nature are the best way to do that. All, all I know is some of the most talented people I've ever worked with were considered to be part of that minority class. Um, and I, I got to the point where I, I didn't even think about it. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I don't know how we do that. I think there's programs that could work that could help with that. One thing that we are very proud of yeah. is of the 21 founders, I think half were women. And we actually had four uh, people of color that presented. Um, you know, whether it's happened on purpose or it's happened just by accident, um, Connect Capital has been very successful in having um, lots of different uh, groups of people yeah. involved in the process. In fact, we have a, a big event coming up later in the fall called We Rock. Yeah, tell us and, about um, Rock. Yeah, so it, it's basically the Investor's Choice event that we did in April. Mm-hmm. It was 21 founders, men, women, people of color, and we had we had 500 people register. Mm-hmm. We had about 400 people that attended, um, and we had 21 people on stage for 10 minutes each. Yeah. And then we had a spin room where they could come and talk to them and all that. We're basically going to package that exact same thing mm-hmm. and do it in September, September 19th, and it's going to be only women founders. Now the people in the audience will be men, women, investors, okay. you know, all that kind of thing. But on stage, it will be exclusively women founders. Um, now, some people say it's a gimmick or, you know, whatever. I I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. I don't care what they say. What, I, what we're trying to do is help uh, a group of individuals that mm-hmm. have been underutilized and under um, not visible as much as they should. Yeah. And so by us doing this, we're hopeful that we can start to kind of stem that tide. Yeah. And yeah, it's obvious. I mean, we, we're not we're not saying, oh, it's just... By happenstance, 20 of our founders were all women. No, right. we're going after it them. as yeah. a women's event. We're also doing a veterans event. We're also doing oh, some other cool. things like that. So some of these other groups that are kind of less less advantaged, or whatever you want to call it, they don't have as much of an opportunity. Yeah, I think that we, you know, groups like Kenneth Capital and others can make a difference and and not even apologize about it. Just say, yeah, we're just doing this. And, mm-hmm. and uh, it was very successful last year. Um, and we're excited about it coming up in September. Thank you for your work in doing that. Yeah. I really appreciate that. Some of the things we talk about on the podcast are leadership at some point becomes about visibility, mm-hmm. right? And so this is operate. This is offering those women or veterans or whoever else hasn't had that platform to get the visibility they need to see if their ideas will work, right? Because like you said at the beginning with Connect Careful, sometimes you don't even know who to connect with or what the next step is to mm-hmm. see if it's viable or how it might be viable. Um, are the women ever nervous? Sometimes we need to talk women into claiming the mindset of like leadership and... Yeah, I, I think you know, everybody's nervous. You yes, know. of course. Uh, I, I tell people that... Um, there, there's this there's this illness that's just hit Utah called entrepreneurial itis, and it, <laughs> okay. the symptoms the symptoms are um, unrealistic optimism and mm. the random psychiatrists where you're on the on the you know the train or on the plane or whatever you're t- always talking to people about your business. Sure. You you have high expectations that are not really even rational in many cases. 
um, you you spend all of your time in a room with either yourself or a very small group of people. Um, <laughs> so you're socially, you know, awkward. You don't really <laughs> talk to anybody other than your business. Okay. Um, you know, so so people that do entrepreneurial type activities are kind of crazy anyway, right? Mm. Because people are like, their family is like, why, why don't you just get a job like sure. Johnny did? Yep. You know, he goes to work every day and it's Then you can be home at five. And yeah. And you seem to be working really hard, long hours, and for nothing. So, you know, it is, people in this kind of uh, environment are a little little uh, mental anyway. <laughs> and you mean that uh, in the best way. Yes, in, in the best <laughs> way. Um, but my philosophy on this is that there's a difference between being a mentor and being a sponsor. Okay. Um, a mentor is someone who will give you advice and give you counsel and help you. Yeah. We have a tremendous mentor group of people that do that. A sponsor is different. A sponsor will will promote you and talk about you mm -hmm. and drive your and try and drive your success yeah. when you're not in the room. Mm -hmm. A mentor will help you prepare for that. And a mentor can also be a sponsor, don't get yes, me wrong. Right. But a sponsor is someone who's willing to promote you and to talk about you and to um to give you uh, a leg up in that in a room where you're not there. Yes, or might and, not have access to. Yes, mm -hmm. and and that that is a unique situation, and it's something that a lot of people aren't willing to do. It takes there's a risk. Mm -hmm. There's not much of a risk of being a mentor because you know, most times people don't know that you were mentoring someone. Right. A sponsor, if you're in a boardroom or you're in an executive team room or whatever, and yeah. you you tout or you promote someone, that's that's taking a risk. Yeah, that, that's that's going beyond just trying to help someone. That's actually putting yourself on yeah, the line. Using your social capital. And, and we need more people that are willing to be sponsors. Mm. Um, and, and I think the more we do that, the mm -hmm. more people will be comfortable doing that. And that to me is a big shift. That's, that's the, huge. That's a change that we, that we need to promote yeah. and talk about more. So, I really appreciate that. And I can see how they're different. I feel like we have lots of, many groups working towards mentorship with women and claiming those things and coaching and feedback. And it also takes um, those sponsors, right? Yeah. In those rooms where decisions are made who are willing to say, no, let's take a chance on this. Um, and then the women also being ready to say, absolutely, I'm ready to step in. And, and yeah, yeah, I mean, you, once you get a chance, you've got to nail it, right? Yeah. It's like a comedian, you know, somebody has to help you to get on stage but once you're on stage you've <laughs> it's got all to, yours it's either you're going to get laughs or you're going to get heckled yeah so you know this is this is not just a you know and i think that's where the difference in some programs that are like you've got you've got to hire somebody you've got to do this or whatever yeah i think that those programs sometimes don't work because the me the best people don't always end up getting promoted by those sure. initiatives sure however you can not mandate but you can you can kind of drive towards getting people opportunities on stage um and they may win and they may do a great job and they yeah. may not they yeah. may, you know they're of those 21 founders you know i think probably five or six of them probably nailed it and they've already it's so fun because they've actually some mm. of them have actually got fan funding and that as a byproduct okay. Some are, you know, uh, probably the majority, you know, did an okay job. They didn't hurt themselves, but they also didn't maybe help themselves as yeah. much as they could. Yeah. And there were two or three that really struggled and and you know, had a hard time and were nervous. And, yeah. And that kind of thing. And so, you know, once you're on stage, you got it. It's got it's you. Right? Yeah. But to get on stage, that's where the hard part is. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, giving people that opportunity, that's something you can not mandate, but you can drive towards. But yeah. But having people stand on their own two feet once they're on stage, yeah. that's the Serengeti plane, right? Right, you know, that's, absolutely. You know, are you ready? Are you prepared? Have you done the work? Because mm -hmm. you don't get very many opportunities on stage. If you bomb, <laughs> then, you know, and, that, and that's just the reality, it's right? Just that's, the reality. That's just the reality. Yeah. If, you, if, you do, if you don't do well, it's going to be hard for you to get another opportunity. Um, I think those, those uh, founders that were on stage that maybe struggled a little bit, um, I don't think anyone bombed. I don't think anyone no. was not prepared. I think some were more in their element on stage. Yes. Um, but that's not necessarily an indication of success either, right? I mean, some people are a little bit more introverted. Yep. They're a little bit nervous on stage. Um, I tell people that nerves 
or not a bad thing. That just means you care. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and so I don't think you can ruin your chances, but you got to be ready. Mm-hmm. And, and I think we can give, we can mandate the ability to give people opportunities, but when it all comes down to it, they're the ones that have got to take advantage of that. Mm, excellent point. So it, you, know, yeah. you can only do so much. I know that one thing that Pat has talked about since the beginning of the Women's Leadership Institute is that we are non-prescriptive. We give you the principles. Mm-hmm. We show you how they apply, but we don't tell you exactly how to implement them yeah. because that's under your own leadership purview, right? Mm-hmm. That's your own trial and error. That is your own workforce and you engaging with them. So it never can just be a checkbox because yeah. change takes more than a checkbox. And I also love the idea that once people get the opportunity, maybe they step off the stage and say, that is not what I ever want to do again, right? Or maybe they're like, that was so great, and I need to fix this, this, and this before I go on next time. You know, just the learning process that can happen through that. And, and that's where, you know, that bright light mm. changes. Because, um, like you said, some people may, may get on stage and realize, this is the worst thing. In fact, you know, I joke with people that, that being a speaker or having a presentation uh, is, is, you know, there are people that would rather be in the casket than the person talking about the person yeah. that was in the yes, casket. Yes, totally. Um, and it, it, there's some people, they, they thrive in it. Yeah. Know, they love it. Some people were very introverted and they kind of trained themselves. Yes. Uh, you know, I joke about, you know, I, I'm a very big introvert when it comes to a lot of stuff. Um, but I've been able to do it enough and practice and, and, you know, I've gotten better at it. And there are people that are so much better than me on stage. You know, one of the things that we are so glad that we did was, um, had Christine Woodfelt from Rev Road come and be our MC. Mm. Um, there are people she that was, are, she was, she was great. amazing. Yeah. She, she's, and, and she's a wonderful partner. Uh, Rev Road's a great partner of ours. Um, there's some people that are just naturally talented yeah. at being on stage. Yeah. Some can can work on it and practice mm-hmm. and get better at it, um, but some people just don't like it. You know, it's just not their thing. And you know, what's funny is that there's. It seems like in large in companies that make it big, there's always someone who's the who's the the front man, right? Yes. And, and then there's the guy behind the scenes, the one mm-hmm. behind the curtain, kind of doing all the work and not the work, but doing all of the you know, the stuff that the front man does. All that do. logistical operations. Yeah. And so yeah. for some people, they're like, you know what? I don't want to be on stage. I'd love to be working with the person preparing them to yeah. go on stage. Or I'd like to be operationally, you know, focused where I'm doing stuff around the company and that. So not everybody wants to be the lead singer of a rock band, right? Yep. Some are okay being a roadie or running around in the yeah. background. Um, and you need both. So some people in may realize, you know what? This isn't really my thing. Or they may say, you know, I this is my thing, but I need to find somebody who, who enjoys yeah. that. Yeah, that idea of yeah. getting the right people in the right seats on the bus, yeah. that idea. Yeah. Or as I think back to different <laughs> um, different people that I know who have started companies, there's always like very different personalities, right? The visionary, the one who's going to pitch it, the one who can talk to it, and then the person who can actually make it happen and mm-hmm. execute on that vision. So I love that you said yeah. that. I think that's really important for uh, founders and startups to really think about who is that, mm-hmm. especially in the age of social media when founders and your brand are almost always synonymous. Mm-hmm. That's an important thing to consider. Yeah. Okay. Um, I love this conversation, especially because women and money has so many layers of nuance and bias both with men and with women and in everything so i think this conversation about money and and founders is important yeah yeah um is there anything we haven't talked about today that you would want to share with this audience um yeah i I guess what i would say is is that um you you were mentioning money and and that um my my wife has been the one that's done our finances okay um really throughout our marriage um partly because i can't keep two numbers together and, <laughs> oh, no. and, and i i'm i'm very i'm a very impulsive person when it comes to spending money okay she's a little bit more you know thought you know let's think about it let's mm. maybe we shouldn't mm. do that um i think there were probably a lot of those kind of scenarios and um i guess what i would say is, is that um you know, it doesn't matter if you're a man or woman. It doesn't matter if you're good at that different thing or whatever. 
everybody needs to have training on that because lives change quickly. Um, you know, so if it, if the husband in the family is the one that does the money, um, you know, I have a, a, a you know, a brother-in-law that, that passed away instantly, had a heart attack, yeah. was gone before he even hit the ground. And his wife really, really struggled. Um, Cause she wasn't she involved. Wasn't, she in wasn't it. involved. She wasn't prepared. She hadn't, she wasn't part of the conversation. She didn't yeah. do a lot of those things. And it was a tremendous challenge for her. And, and that can go either way, right? Yep. You know, it's, and so the days of, you know, hey, you go earn the money and I'll take care of the house or, or vice versa or whatever. Those days are, are they're just not really realistic anymore. Mm. And so people, um, you know, two of, uh, two of my daughters are married. The other one is, is single and then I have a young, younger one. And, you know, the ones that aren't married have had to do that, you know, that financial sure. model. Um, and I think, I just think it's important And groups like the Women's Leadership Institute, um, people like She Money and She yeah. Place and, and, um, you know, Anne-Marie Wallace at the Women's Business Center and that there, there's so many opportunities out there for, for people to get training and education mm -hmm. around these things. Mm -hmm. And I would just, in a parting chat, just, you know, encourage people you don't have to go to WLA. You don't have to go to WPC. You don't have to go to She Money or She Place or any of these organizations. But find something somewhere that can help you yeah. understand it because everybody's got to have financial training and education. Yeah. Um, because otherwise you'll do dumb stuff and, and you know, you'll, you'll, you'll struggle. And, and there's so many resources out there that can help you with this. Um, so I would encourage people to look into it and, and to become educated, become aware of what's mm -hmm. going on and take advantage of some of these organizations that are out there that, that do this and uh, do a great job of it. Yeah, really good point. Money's not going away and it impacts everything, right? Whether you're working in a corporation or you're handling your own finances or whatever that might be. So that is a great point. Well, they, <laughs> I can't remember where this came through. I'm going to butcher it, but... Um, you know, money doesn't bring happiness, but neither does poverty, right? And and with money, at least you have resources and you have options. Sure. Um, and so, yeah, it's a necessary evil in our society, and it's not going away. No, no. that's it's the byproduct of a, of a capitalist society. Sure. Um, and so you've got to educate yourself, or you're going to struggle. Well, and along with money comes uh, decision making, right? Yeah. Really leadership decision making of where are you going to put your resources what are your priorities right um, all those things are all tied together james if people want to get involved with connect capital well how how do they do that um so we um we're, we're always looking for three different types of people okay the first is obviously founders so anyone who has a business idea or or uh you know feels like they have a they have a good business you know a, a a good idea for a startup and they want help. Okay. Um, go to, and, and I, I, first of all, I hate our website right now. It's <laughs> terrible, but it's the only way to, to <laughs> get people to go. Um, it's, it's connect capital. It's spelled kind of funky. It's yeah. K I N E C T capital, okay. um, dot org. And so you can go there and up in the top right hand corner, there's a little button that says, you know, engage with uh, connect capital. Okay. Um, you can go there. So that's the first group is the founder group. The second group is the mentor group. Mm. Um, it's a group of uh, people that they're looking to give back. And mm -hmm. we have 800 some odd people that have done mentoring over wow. the, over those 41 years, probably 350 or so are still kind of in the game and a hundred are very active. Um, so if you have an interest in doing that, mm -hmm. um, and I'm just gonna throw this out there, just send me an email, james at connectcapital.org um, and we'll get you involved in that process. Um, and then the third group is investors. Um, sure. And so same kind of thing. If you're an investor that's looking to attend some of these events, we we do a monthly pitch event at yeah. the Kiln offices uh, in Lehigh. It's called Third Thursday at 3. Yes. Um, Ray Smithson is an amazing guy. I was Built reading this about from those. Scratch. Mm -hmm. um, every month we do uh, four founders on stage giving their, uh, building their uh, business or pitching their business. Um, 
and we can help you get involved in that process. Okay. So there's lots of different groups that, that are in, in, entailed, but we please don't hesitate. Uh, once again, it's james at connectcapital.org. <laughs> we'll send, put it in the show send notes. Send me information and, and we'll get you involved. But we're doing some amazing things and, and uh, all of it is because of people willing to either stick their neck out or help those people that have stuck their neck out or, right. or help those people find people that are looking to put money on businesses like mm-hmm. that. So it's kind of that three... Uh, those three circles, I guess. Yeah, and Utah's really growing that way. So yeah. thank you for your work in this. And um, thank you for walking the talk. Like, I haven't known you very long, but in the times that I've known and I met with you, you are very sincere and true to your word. And I really appreciated getting to know you in that way. Likewise. So, thank you. Thank you.